when you're ready. Oh, sorry, yeah. I... Who's going to let them in? Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the program. I see lots of people we know. Exciting, exciting program. Uh, I see. Vijay Advani from uh, the Bay Area, Raj Mohan Gandhi. So nice to see you, Raj Mohan. Who else have we got? Let's see, lots of people coming in. Ranjan, I see Ranjan in Ohio. Kausik, welcome, welcome to the show. And we have a young one there as well. Ram from Minnesota, Shamlal, Bay Area. We've got a really diverse audience, a uh, bunch of participants here from uh, various different parts. I see Nish from Boston, Consul General Randir Jaiswal from uh, New York, the Indian Consul General in New York. Welcome, Randir. Uh, delighted, honored to have you. Emily Nine in Delaware, Rohit Menezes, Bay Area, Nisha Acharya, Boston. Fantastic. Give it uh, 30 more seconds or so and we'll get started. Ambassador TV Nagendra Prasad uh, in uh, the Bay Area, welcome. Consul General of India in uh, San Francisco, delighted to have you. So let's get started, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and spending a portion of your afternoon, evening, or for some of you morning, uh, as the case may be in India, for this event. Uh, you know, there are a few topics that are as emotive as uh, the partition. It is, of course, as is widely accepted by historians, the largest forced migration in human history. And so it's not surprising that there is an enormous amount of interest in this subject. Uh, as the diaspora founder, M. R. Rangaswamy, was mentioning to us a short while ago, uh, you know, as we were preparing for this call, uh, when he posted about it on his LinkedIn, there was just a tremendous interest in terms of people wanting to join and ask questions and so forth. Uh, and so we are delighted that all of you are here. I'm Sanjeev Joshipura, and I'm uh, speaking with you from Fairfax, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. And I'm the executive director of Indiaspora. Uh, most of you know Indiaspora, but for those of you who don't, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2012. And our mission is to amplify the voice of the global Indian diaspora as a force for good. Uh, we focus on philanthropy and social impact, on nonpartisan sociopolitical and civic engagement, and on building global connections among the top Indian diaspora worldwide across a variety of different professions and different geographies. Uh, today's event specifically is about the 1947 partition, as you know. And we are really delighted uh, couldn't think of a better organization to partner with for this event than the 1947 Partition Archive. Uh, at the very outset, I should thank Dr. Rashina Humayun, one of our Indiaspora members, for coming to us with this idea. I know that she serves on the board at uh, the Partition Archive. And uh, uh, Rashina, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're on the call. Uh, and uh, you know it was, uh, it was a great suggestion. Uh, 
you know, all of you can probably visit the 1947 Partition Archives website, but they really do yeoman work in chronicling this event that is both so historical and yet resonates so much. And as we can see, it resonates across generations. Uh, people that have lived through the partition, but also people that have not, and now it strikes a chord still so many years hence. Today, we are gonna have an excellent series of uh, speakers. We have three speakers. We will start with Gunita Singh Bhalla, Dr. Gunita Singh Bhalla, who is the chairperson and founder of the 1947 Partition Archives. Uh, then we have Mr. Jasbir Bhatia, who actually lived through the partition and was a witness and will give you sort of a, an eyewitness account, if you will, so many years later. And then we have Dr. Aaron Riggs, who is a citizen historian. Uh, this, uh, the, their, their remarks will last for about 25 minutes. And then after that, I will come back to moderate questions and answers uh, with everybody, all of you participants. Uh, and I'd encourage you, obviously, to, uh, to really get engaged and get involved. But let me start by introducing uh, Gunita. Uh, Dr. Bhalla is the founder and executive director of the 1947 Partition Archives. And in 1947, her family migrated from Lahore to Amritsar on the 14th of August. Prior to her present work, she was an experimental condensed matter physicist and completed her tenure as a postdoctoral researcher at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory at the University of California at Berkeley. In December 2012, she studied quantum confinement at interfaces that include oxide heterostructures and domain walls in multiferroids. Now, someone's going to have to explain that to me. Gunita, it's going to have to be you <laughs> above my pay grade. Uh, but without further ado, let me turn it over to you, Gunita, to uh, take this program away. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. I'd love to thank, I want to start out by thanking you and uh, MR and Ruta and Muncie and Ashish and everybody at the team. And also Rashina Hamayun, who helped, um, you know, brought up the idea for this event. And we're all here together because of her. Uh, so um, let me just start out by saying, um, you know, it's been quite a journey. We're about to hit our 10 year mark on this journey. And when we started out, um, you know, wanting to do this work, partition was like a forgotten memory. And it is such an important part of our identity and who we are. And I think um, my generation and the generation, the next generation has started to, you know, question the current state of affairs. And a lot of it's connected to partition. So this history is starting to come up a lot more. Um, and uh, let me just pull up a presentation here that I created so that I can uh, explain the journey to you a little bit. Um, maybe Sanjeev, you'll have to tell me how I can make this live <laughs> quickly. Absolutely, uh, and I'm gonna request Mansi your help here. Okay, I see this uh, share screen, I'm, I'm able to get it, all right. Okay, so, um, Pardon me for one second as I make this a little bit more bearable for you. Hopefully it's full screen and you can see the whole thing now. Okay. So what we did was something a little bit unique at the time, 10 years ago when we started this work, but it has grown in popularity um, first, you know, in the United States and now all over the world and in India, it's becoming really popular too. And it's using oral history to document um, history because in the past for you know, hundreds of years, uh, well, at least the societies where history was being captured, it was usually captured by a few scholars and people who maybe had limited experiences. And it was usually um, you know, sort of like the really big headlining events that were captured. It was you know, what one king did or what one leader did. Uh, but a lot of history and a lot of what happens is actually you know, collective uh, effort of the people. Basically, a lot of people, everybody <laughs> contributes to making history what it is. And you can't truly understand what's happening if you don't understand what happened across classes, ac across castes, across geography. Um, so you get a very limited sort of perspective of history, the kind of history that, you know, I was taught in school um, had a somewhat of a limited perspective. And so oral history today is becoming a means of capturing voices from 
all strata of society, especially groups that have been left out, which is, it turns out, most of humanity. OK, okay. just figuring out how to use the scroll feature on, on Zoom. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of my background. I was born in India. Uh, I come from Punjab, so I spent a lot of time growing up near the Vaga border. In fact, visiting the Vaga border, it was like kind of one of those fun summer day things my cousin and uh, cousins and I did as a kid. Uh, we would just go there, wave at the guards, and at the time you didn't have this elaborate uh, infrastructure there. It was literally just a fence with no man's land, and we used to go and wave at the Pakistani guards. They were super friendly, um, and we used to uh, talk about how our family had come from the other side. Um, so I was born in Delhi and my dad was in the army. So I lived in all these different places. I lived in Leh in Ladakh when it was just a village. Uh, and it was basically just military people and the local population. Um, and then I lived in Kashmir. So very, you know, close to the conflict there. Lived in Jammu and then Pune, um, Chandigarh, and then over to the United States um, in the 90s. And so I'm kind of, a, I guess, a cultural mutt in that way, but I had enough of an exposure in my early days to this history or this connection to this history um, that, you know, it remained a big question mark in my life. So what happened in 1947? Well, I'm not going to give you the full history. There are a lot of books that have been written about the official stuff that happened at the time, the decision making that led to the kind of big breakdown in society that we saw. Uh, but you know, if I were to summarize it, we've had um, uprisings and freedom movements for a very long time in South Asia. Now, I won't call it India because before 1947, you didn't really have in India. You had uh, British occupied regions that they called India. Remember that this was a European terminology. And then you had the indigenous kingdoms that were there, the states. And yes, a lot of the states were protectorates. Um, so they had an agreement with uh, the British India that was very similar in nature to what, you know, sort of Japan has today with the United States. But that doesn't mean that Japan is part of the United States. Um, so that distinction is really interesting, especially when we do our interviews and we interview people who were from the princely states. They seem to have a very different perspective of India compared to people who lived within the British Indian states. Um, and so as we're going into 1947, uh, the British can no longer quell these uprisings that are happening within South Asia that, you know, you've probably heard of the 1857, some call it the first uh, freedom war, some call it the mutiny. So these uprisings were going on every time, you know, some of the kingdoms would fall to the British. Um, but, you know, after World War II, they no longer had the resources to really quell these and they wanted to get out as fast as possible because I think they were also afraid of what was gonna happen when these uprisings, um, this revolution, freedom revolution got out of hand. Um, so they pulled out as fast as possible. And then we have the entire history of how the Radcliffe line was designed. There's a lot of literature out there about that. You probably know it was done very hastily. Um, and Mr. Radcliffe you know, was flown in because he didn't have an emotional connect uh, with uh, South Asia. And so he was flown in to kind of use um, census data that was collected and which was, uh, which we now know was inaccurate um, to draw this line, which went through people's farms, went through people's homes, it went through all kinds of structures. Um, and it, there was a lot of confusion around this line. Um, actually, before I go into the statistics of partition, I'll also say something. Uh, when you know, when this confusion was happening, one of the reasons that we've learned through our work why this mass violence broke out is um, you literally had a breakdown of the police and military services. So um, you imagine what would happen today in any big city if you took away the police and military. And suddenly you also had um, a democracy. So you had these new politicians, they were vying for power in their constituencies. And there was a lot of incentive for them to drive out people who were unlikely to vote for them. And often that was people of, you know, the opposite religion or a different religion than them. And um, we've also found from talking to a lot of perpetrators that a lot of the, um, the impetus for the violence was actually loot. 
people usually attacked the wealthier communities um, and they did it because they were promised loot finders keepers. And so at least that's from talking to a lot of the perpetrators of what was in their minds um, you know, that led them to this violence. So going into the statistics, nearly 1% of the world's population became refugees at the time and 14% of the world's people were impacted directly. So everywhere in South Asia was impacted because refugees went everywhere. So even if you didn't have to migrate and you didn't have violence in your town, you had Punjabis and Sindhis and you know, Bengalis coming up and setting up shops over there or you had local people that migrated. That's what we found from our work. And so imagine if we had not documented the Holocaust and if we had not documented Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, now this is a motivation that, you know, now it seems obvious why we should document partition, but 10 years ago when we um, started this work, it was a dead memory and no one was talking about it. So it took an immense effort to convince people that this was actually an important um, documentation. Uh, that we needed to do. My personal inspiration came from Hiroshima. Um, I had been thinking about, you know, partition for a very long time, in fact, my whole life, because I grew up knowing my family had come from the other side, and I wondered why I couldn't go to the other side, why, you know, especially when I was in my 20s, I was a little bit of a globetrotter. Um, so I was traveling all over the world and wondering why I couldn't go to Lahore, my, you know, family's ancestral city why it was so difficult. Um, and so there was a lot of curiosity around partition and I didn't know what to do about it. I wanted to do something about it to bridge the disconnect between the folk history I heard and the completely you know, missing story of partition in our textbooks. And so the aha moment came when I was at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. They have an incredibly powerful archive of oral histories. And this is back in 2008. And I was so deeply moved. I was like, okay, I get it. We need to, um, get our grandparents and parents voices out there because they're the ones who experienced this and they're the ones who can tell it um, in a way that nobody can deny. Problem in 2008, there were no sources of primary witness accounts. The remaining witnesses were in their 80s and above. It was a dwindling population. There was a great urgency and, we, and, the, and people were dispersed all over the globe. So that led us um, to come up with the solution of crowdsourcing. Um, it's not a coincidence that I was at the Berkeley Physics Department where the term crowdsourcing was actually coined around that time, I think 2007. It was coined, uh, in fact, the people won the Nobel Prize for the protein solving problem, which is what they used it for. Won't go into the details of that, but we used the same concept for crowdsourcing oral history. And it was sort of the first time anyone had done it for a social science, but it's becoming more and more popular now. Um, so I just, this, Image on the left, you can't really see it probably if you're on a screen, but it's millions of little tiny stick figures building a rainbow together. I've been inspired by this painting since I was a kid. And I always told myself that one day, um, if I were to help build something, I'd love to bring a lot of people together to build something greater than ourselves uh, for the benefit of society. That's kind of how I interpreted this image. And it was, it formed the early inspiration of the idea of crowdsourcing. So we've been doing that since 2009. Uh, I left my job in 2013 at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, and to give you an overview of our mission, it's to document, preserve, and share eyewitness accounts from all ethnic, religious, and socioeconomic communities impacted by the partition of British India. Now, why that's important is 10 years ago, and it's actually even true in India today and Pakistan as well, uh, Bangladesh as well, um, that, you know, uh, in the early days, people used to say to us, like, okay, well, if you're Punjabi, why are you recording Sindhi stories? Um, or if you're, you know, Muslim, why are you recording Sikh stories? And those kind of things would come up. People were, like, really shocked that we would care about these stories regardless of religion and ethnicity. I think it was, you know, a lot of it was being, one, a military kid, and second, having grown up in the U.S. where everything's much more egalitarian, and you don't, um, pigeonhole people based on their religion. And I mean, uh, you know, we still have those problems here, but they're not as uh, big as they are in South Asia. Um, so having this in our mission statement was very, very important in our early days. And now people have come to accept this platform as sort of all encompassing and for everybody. So um, crowdsourcing, we started teaching oral history classes with the help of the regional oral, uh, oral history office at UC Berkeley. 
Uh, we were very lucky to have those resources in the Bay Area and Stanford University's history department. Um, and we started teaching them online back, um, you know, very early on, 2010, even before we were an organization. And um, what was really cool about this approach is that not only was it fast, we didn't have to raise millions of dollars to go out and do this work, which is how it would have been done traditionally. You'd have scholars being paid, um, you know, full-time jobs going out there and doing this work, but uh, we didn't have that kind of money when this work started. Um, and doing it, you know, through crowdsourcing was fast. Um, it was frugal. We had global reach through the internet. Um, so this, you know, part of the reason this work is happening is because of the internet. And it was really engaging. Suddenly young people were interviewing um, family members or community members. Stories were beginning to spread in the community and this dead history started to come to life in a really big way. Um, just some images of when we first started um, our work, we were doing some test runs, if you will. <laughs> uh, we, were, we launched a scholarship um, to do this work, uh, some of this work, especially in rural areas where crowdsourcing is not as uh, accessible. Um, and so before we ran the scholarship, we did a test run. So this is in the walled city of Amritsar. We spent several weeks there, myself and Ranjan Preet, who was another um, person living in Berkeley at the time. And she joined as a volunteer in those early days. And we went shop to shop looking for elders to interview. And it, it was an amazing experience because some of these shops are passed down in the same family for like 300 years, something that you know we don't really know about. Um, so this is us in the Bay Area. We taught classes at UC Berkeley in the early days. Uh, we tried to go to every single South Asian event. We went to mosques, we went to uh, you know, mandirs, we went to gurdwaras, we went everywhere that we possibly could to spread the word. So it was super grassroots in the early days and completely volunteer run because, you know, as a postdoc, I didn't really have like a nest egg or anything saved up um, to kind of uh, invest in this. Um, so here's how it works. So we train citizen, uh, we train citizen historians uh, online through these workshops, which uh, I'm proud to say we've now taught every other week for the last seven years straight without stopping. And we've taught over 7,000 people how to do this. Um, people come on, they learn how to record these stories, they upload them, and then they share them in the community. Um, you know, we do a lot of social media sharing, and that uh, has actually been another big vehicle of doing this work. So it's gotten a lot more people to come forward. In fact, social media has helped popularize the history of partition. So we got about a million followers on Facebook around 2016, 2017. That number has gone down because Facebook changed their algorithms and they want us to pay a lot of money now to to get followers and as a nonprofit, we don't really uh, follow that. Um, so our, uh, our uh, you know, growth has sort of slowed down because of that. Uh, but anyway, um, on Facebook in 2017, we had 10 million shares, more than 10 million shares of the stories we shared. So you could kind of see organically how this history started to spread really uh, widely all over the world um, through social media and very subtly just through these postings of individual stories um, and thousands of them. And that created a new awareness. And so 2017, 2018, you started to get other projects coming up on partition, which has been pretty neat to watch. Um, so stories are recorded from all over the world. And um, you know, we had to make this image several years ago. People didn't understand this concept of a cloud-based archive. <laughs> so stories come in from all over the world. They're stored in our cloud. And also we have several backups in various locations. We have an office in Delhi and we have an office in Berkeley where we manage um, the collection from and the entire process. In fact, we're very highly volunteer run. So a lot of our team members are volunteers, uh, but they're like very um, sort of very serious volunteer positions. And um, we've recorded actually now over 9,500 stories. We started out at the time of our founding with the goal of 10,000 oral histories. This makes us one of the top five largest oral history archives in the world, I think we may be the third largest um, historical oral history archive. So this doesn't account for something like StoryCorps, which is not historical, but it, they do do um, folklore. Um, so we've uh, over 600 citizen historians who've been uh, confirmed. So we have a lot of people who take our classes, but they're not confirmed eventually. These these uh, people are certified. Um, They've you know, helped document these 9,500 oral histories. They've come from actually now we're up to 15 countries and we're up to over 500 cities and villages represented and we're over 40 languages and dialects. 
Um, so, you know, on our uh, website, you'll see a map if you click on one of the links. I do apologize for those of you guys in the tech world. Um, our website was built in 20, uh, 2011. So it's very, very old. Um, in fact, if any of you want to donate your time and build us a new website, you're most welcome. <laughs> um, so it has an old look, but it serves the purpose as of now. So if you click on a city, you'll see where people migrated to. You can click on, you know, um, individual stories. And if we have a video up on YouTube, you can watch their video. Otherwise, you can, um, you know, click on these photos, look at them. You can read their story and excerpt of it. Um, also, what's cool, we're working with Stanford University Libraries. They're going to be disseminating our collections to universities around the world and to academics. Um, and we have an initial set of universities in India and Pakistan that are already on board. And we've actually just launched a scholarship in collaboration with Tata Trust in India uh, for researchers to come and access the collection at the Indian universities that you see here. Um, University of Delhi, Guru Nanak Dev University, and Ashoka University. So the archive is actively in use right now. We we're in two museums, one, uh, or we've got exhibits in two museums, permanent exhibits, one in the Canadian Museum of Human Rights and one in um, the Virasat e Khalsa Museum in Punjab. Um, we've also been featured in a number of documentaries. So if you guys saw the BBC One documentary, My Family Partition and Me, um, very popular documentary. We actually helped them uh, pro bono at the time because that's what we did at the time uh, several years ago. Um, most of the people interviewed in, those, in that documentary or a lot of people interviewed in that documentary are from the Partition Archive. Um, there are films like Bharat, um, you know, that have been ins inspired by the oral histories uh, in the Partition Archive. And if you look at Pag Milka Pag, um, the makers have told me that they referenced uh, some of our oral histories that were posted online uh, when they made that film, which was, uh, you know, really amazing to hear. And there have been a number of plays and artistic works, and also, of course, a lot of research articles. And thus far, 27 PhDs um, that have used the work of the Partition Archive. Actually, there's probably more now, 27 as of um, at least a year ago. And Erin is one of them. Um, she's going to talk about that in a moment. Um, some of our learnings. I'll just show you a couple of photos. Hopefully, I'm not too much over time. I know I kind of went into a few details there more than I expected. Um, so this is in the Sundarbans, um, March 2018. We interviewed this gentleman who was 108 years old. Uh, it was fascinating. It was my first time in the Sundarbans. I think it is a paradise. It is um, is very rough, uh, but just really beautiful. And it's a lot of lessons to learn from there. So what's um, really kind of sad is that uh, a lot of people who live there today, about 4 million of them, um, they live in areas where even the indigenous population would not live. They were settled there, a lot of, it, a lot of them by force. Um, way back, you know, they were partitioned refugees um, because they were sort of in the lower strata of society. They ended up being given that land. And now those 4 million people are becoming our first climate refugees because that land is going underwater uh, because of the climate crisis. And so um, it was really in interesting to interview this gentleman because he moved there in 47 thinking that there was a lot of opportunity because it was uh, somewhat of a sold as a land of opportunity because they thought that they were going to be able to farm and do all sorts of things but it turned out to be very different in fact now you have the tiger widow crisis so when we were roaming around there um, a lot of um, you know if, if you see the women here who don't have the uh, the red uh, vermilion um, it means that their widows their husbands have been attacked by tigers because the people are not, you know, native to this region, and there's a lot of human wildlife conflict, and that's uh, kind of uh, had its issues, so to speak. Um, so, another story uh, going on the other side of the globe. This is in California. This gentleman, um, he was based in Rodeo at the time when we interviewed him in California. He was 107 when I interviewed him about almost eight years ago. Um, he's unfortunately no more. And uh, he told us a fascinating story where he was still boycotting tea because uh, when they were growing up, and this is you know in before 1920, when they were growing up, um, they considered tea to be something that the British were using to spike their milk to get them addicted, so that the East India Company 
could sell them tea. So he still boycotted tea to this day because to him that was boycotting the East India Company. And he said, until they came around, you know, at least where he was in Punjab, they didn't drink tea. Tea was not a staple drink that it is today. So ultimately, you know, given how I grew up seeing tea as this very staple South Asian drink, um, I guess the East India Company succeeded um, in, their, in their work in spreading tea across South Asia. Um, a lot of garanas were broken at the time of partition. I, I'm forgetting the name of this particular um, interviewee, uh, but we've interviewed a lot of garanas, uh, people belonging to different garanas. You know, when we think of Northern India now, we don't think of um, music, like when you think of Punjab, you don't think of music and arts. It's because uh, those sectors pretty much were killed at the time of partition. You had a lot of garanas that broke up. You had artists that were uprooted and moved across the borders. Um, and a lot of them became really destabilized. They had to, they lost their art because they were trying to survive and they became laborers and things like that. Um, so there's a huge disruption in the arts and culture space due to partition. There's a lot of lost languages that are appearing in the archive. For example, this gentleman um, from the Northwest frontier area, um, somebody who speaks Thorvali language, which is a disappearing language interviewed a number of elders in his community who were impacted by the border between uh, what's now Afghanistan and Pakistan. So that border too, at the time of uh, partition was defined and it had its impact in those regional communities. Uh, so that was a really interesting finding. Um, here, Erin, uh, I had to stick this picture up here because Erin's gonna be speaking. She, she can talk about this interview more later, but um, she's interviewing uh, a gentleman who belongs to the ancient Jewish community, I believe, in India. So a lot of, um, you know, there were, there's a very ancient Jewish community in Cochin, I think, uh, from almost 2000 years ago. And many of them had migrated across South Asia, living in places like Lahore and Karachi. At the time of my uh, partition, many of them migrated to the Bombay area. And then in 1948, they by, uh, migrated to Israel um, because of the builders movement. So Sanjeev, if my time is up, we can move on. Yeah, I think we should, Gunita. This is extremely yeah. informative and fascinating. But, uh, you know, I know we have a couple of other great speakers and then our attendees would love to engage as well. Absolutely. Let's do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gunita. If you want to go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Um, yeah, sure. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. Jasbir Bhatia. Um, so I've known Jasbir Uncle now for quite some time. He was one of our earliest supporters when we did, you know, back in 2013, when I left my job and we did the first um, founding donor round at $5,000 seed. Uh, so Mr. Jasmine Bhatia not only came forward into this experimental project as an interviewee, and he volunteered his story, but he um, came forward as a founding donor, but he also uh, went the extra mile and he became um, an interviewer. So he trained as a citizen historian and he's been going out and setting an example for a lot of the younger people and recording oral histories, which has been amazing. And now I'll read his official bio. Mr. Jasmir Bhatia was born in December 1940 in Sialkot, Punjab, now Pakistan. He migrated to India during partition in August 1947 and shared the pain and suffering uh, what millions of others went through during um, India's most tragic period of modern history. He had to walk his way to India along with his family. His parents had to leave all of their assets back there, therefore went through a hard life growing up. He studied engineering and worked in uh, Bharat Heavy Electricals for 14 years and migrated to the United States in 1977. Um, he was introduced to the Partition Archive in 2014. Okay, I was wrong. It wasn't 2013, it was 2014. So I'm gonna hand over the mic now to Mr. Jasveer Bhatia. Hello, good evening. I hope everybody's doing well. <clears throat> um, thank you so much, uh, Gunita ji. Uh, you have almost said what I have prepared to say. <laughs> so anyhow, a uh, few thoughts of my side. First of all, I'd like to thank 1947 Partition Archive and India Spora for the opportunity to participate uh, in this program and for the great effort to highlight the important work being done by the archive. Now, time is a great healer, as they say, but the old wounds leave their scars. I was attending a Taikan conference in Santa Clara in May 2014. 
when I saw 1947 partition archive showcased in the conference exhibitions. My curiosity immediately grew and um, I talked to the people there. They hurriedly arranged my interview with uh, Ms. Dina Kapoor uh, from the archive the next day and I was asked to narrate the story of my migration. I was born in December 1914 in Salkot, now in Pakistan, and walked to India along with the parents and two other siblings. It took us six terrible long days without much of food and water because there were dead bodies in wells and ponds. And we crossed River Ravi and made it to Dera Baba Nanak on the Indian side of the river. It seemed a very daunting task to, re to recollect my experience as a child, then 67 years later. But I surprised myself when the memory of the whole journey unfolded and I spoke almost for one and a half hours. We left our home in a rush in the middle of the night because a mob attack on the village was imminent. So the family lost all assets. We came with just the clothes on our back. The same night our home was looted and set on fire. There was no going back as our family had hoped. It was a hard life growing up in India. Because our family had felt, no, we will go away from the village for the night and come back in the morning. There was no such thing that now never that morning never came. I was impressed by the work of the archive and realized the importance of it. So with the humble contribution, I became the founder donor and then also a citizen historian to collect more stories. You know, it's heartbreaking to record the painful stories of the survivors who suffered in many ways during the massive exodus from one homeland to a new one. 10 to 15 million people were uprooted and over a million people died for whom freedom never came. Looking back at my own experiences and that of others, I now see it like a, like a case studies of human behavior in different circumstances. In my case, we were to cross a town called Narawal and the street we walked through had for me knee deep water, knee deep mud, apparently purposely created by the mobsters to slow us down. Halfway through, I saw someone slowly pouring drinking water from a brass utensil over a courtyard boundary wall. For safety of the person, we could not see, the, for safety the person could not be seen, but only his fingers holding the utensils. A few people drank the water, others did not because they thought the water might be poisoned. And as we moved on, at the end of the street, there was a huge mob standing there with all kind of, you know, primitive weapons, axes and kirpans, and swords and spears and anything, whatever they had it, to basically attack on us and kill people. Fortunately, we had a small contingent of soldiers under a British officer, and they were located strategically, and they were holding the crowd back. I remember I tried to wash my legs because I was wearing shorts. In the water, there was a pond there, and they said, no, 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 you have to get, get fast, go away, don't stop here. They would not even let us clean our legs. There was so much mud and there was, there were rocks and whatever underneath. So this told me the two faces of the human character. One was a noble Muslim, and the other side, a stark evil group of people. The same community, same people, same families, and that, has, that scene has been imprinted on my mind ever since. And uh, it was the most remarkable thing which I ever, I ever seen in my life. There are many other cases since I have collected many stories. Similar cases happened with other people. In one of the cases, a friend of mine, Mr. Indra, 
they had to walk from Lahore to India on foot. They had a family, they had a grandfather, his mother and his uncles. On the way, he recalls that there was this bullock cart on which the dead bodies of the parents were lying there. And his child, maybe a year and a half, approximately, to his, to his imagination, he was sitting looking at his parents. And also he was looking at the, at the people walking by. And as he recalls, nobody ever bothered to pick up their child. The child was so tired, maybe he lost the energy even to cry. Going further, the grandfather needed a stick to walk. And the stick, you know, in India, they have stick with the handle was a little bit of silver on it, on it golden, uh, silver, silver coated. And there was a Baluch army. Even that they snatched away from him because it was, there was some, some silver on it. That was the cruelty those people suffered. And it was the military who was trying to rob people. So ultimately the grandfather could not walk as fast as the other could. And one point he recalls that I was very thirsty and I told my mom, I am, I am very thirsty. So she could not find water and yet she saw some small pond. And she went there, she folded her dupatta, her coverage, her shawl in seven layers and tried to filter some water. And she saw a dead body in the pond. So that was the water he could uh, drink. And she was beckoning to her family and brothers, please hold on, please wait for me, I'm coming. But nobody bothered, they just kept on. The same family who would be just getting each other so much, but in those adverse circumstances, everybody was for one second. And now when they reached India, they reached Batala, and this grandfather did not show up. They searched for him two days. He did not show up. And they even hired people to try to find him, but no. Ultimately, the grandfather slowly trekked along. And after two days, he showed up and came back to the family. Some people had to fight back. One Mr. Surya, Mr. Dillon, they were held up in Sagoda for two months. And they said every night there was firing from each side. We had guns. We would fire on the other side because they were supposed to get army from India and they did not come. And uh, when they will go to the town to buy some food, people will keep the money and not give them any food. And those, those are the kind of stories which we had to hear and reflect upon them. What is the human nature? But there are some people who just survived just by luck. The case of Dr. Romani, they were from North, Northwest Punjab and uh, they wanted to come to India. They wanted to board a train. They came to the rail, railway station and the border, the train had just left. So they were left behind. So what happened is the train came back because the train had some soldiers on them and some soldier might was possibly left behind. So the train had gone ahead and they came back and they were able to board that train. And they told us that in the subsequent train, everybody was killed. In there. So it was just a sheer luck, a certain divine power behind it or whatever we can call it. That's how they made to India. So these are some of the stories so difficult to really simulate, really internalize. But there's endless stories and it's, it's very difficult even to record these stories. Some stories, most often people break down, emotionally break down, they start crying. Even me, I, I start crying because when you hear somebody's story, when you relate yourself to your own story, and the whole scene comes back. So this is some of the experiences I have. And uh, I could go on a long time if the time permits. Um, how much more time I have? I thought I was supposed to speak for eight, 10 minutes. Um, 
But this is what the gist of experience is. And uh, naturally, we had a very hard life growing in India. My father had virtually left everything. But since he was educated, he was able to make some, get a job and do his work his way up. But um, it has been a very painful experience going through. You know, we left our homes, which were our homes for ancestors of centuries, and suddenly it was no more ours. I hope that this archive <clears throat> serves as a lesson for the future generations who will read these stories and realize that making such reckless political decisions has consequences and, and perhaps those who will grow up with these stories, they will be better informed if they become politicians someday. This helps them to make better decisions how to deal with mankind and not make decisions for their own political benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Uncle. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, you know, I, I share your hope on that for the future, especially a lot of young people who can uh, get a deep grasp of this history. And you know, some of them will grow up to become the next generation of leaders. And in order to avoid this in the future, um, you know, you have to know what happened in the past and what went wrong. So we haven't done that yet. Uh, collectively, you know, in South Asia. And I think uh, we can help as an archive, we can help push us in that direction. Um, so next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Riggs. Um, so Dr. Aaron Riggs, I, I met Aaron a long time ago. I think she joined us in 2013. And she joined us as a digital archivist um, volunteer. That program has run as a, a volunteer-based program for um, since inception, basically. So basically a lot of archivists will sit in our office and now it's remote. As the stories arrive into the digital cloud, they sort them, they spend a couple of hours on each story making sure you know, all the metadata is there, the videos are okay. And then they do all the communication with the interviewees and so on. So that's, the, that's what archiving entails. So Erin joined us in that position and then she stayed with us um, uh, as well, later she reconnected with us as a researcher, her work as an archivist inspired her to define a very sort of groundbreaking research project that nobody had thought of um, on partition. And she found a mentor who would take her on and she eventually got a Fulbright scholarship to go to India. Now I'm gonna read her official bio. So Erin Riggs received her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Geography at the University of California in Berkeley in 2013. And her MA and PhD degrees from Binghamton University in Anthropology in 2015 and 2020, respectively. Erin um, specializes in contemporary archeology, span focusing on displacement in the recent past and material negotiations of national belonging. Her studies and research in India have been supported by the Fulbright Nehru Student Research Grant and the US, Department, US State Department's Critical Language Scholarship. She's currently a research associate at Binghamton University and has been involved with the 1947 Partition Archive in various capacities since 2013. So over to you, Erin. Thanks so much for that introduction, Gunita. I am just going to pull up my slides here. Uh oh. Can you can you see them yet? There's a little share screen button at the bottom. Yeah. Here we go. I think I got it now. Can everyone see? Yep. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I want to talk a little bit today about how beyond being this really important repository of witness accounts, the Partition Archive is also um, a group that really works to engage the public in both partition histories, but also an interest in South Asian communities and histories in general. And it's also um, a resource of what's quickly becoming a disappearing um, asset to researchers, which is part partition witness accounts. And it's also a community of tons of really active people who are all really interested in this history. And in learning about um, people's lives who come from families who were impacted by this history. 
So to illustrate um, these three points, oh, I wanna talk about how they featured within my own experience. When I first became involved with the archive, I really knew not very much about partition. Even though I grew up in California, it's kind of surprising because there's such a huge community of prominent South Asians in California, but in Californian high schools, you actually learn relatively little about this history. And even though I was very involved in studying oral history as an undergraduate student and even specifically displacement. So I had worked on um, interviewing people who had been interned in Japanese internment camps as an undergraduate student. But even though I was kind of focused in theoretically similar areas, I really didn't know very much about the partition. So when I had this position, I was really overwhelmed by how massive the impact of this historic event had been. And um, in addition to working as an intern, I also became a volunteer oral historian and started interviewing people both in California. And then once I relocated to New York, I continued to interview people in New York. And it was amazing to me how um, so many people within your communities, your neighbors, you, you never had to go very far to find a family that had been directly impacted by this history. So I think this really illustrates how the partition archive, beyond being this resource that um, researchers can use in the future, is really educating the public through events, through just its visibility about South Asia in general, but specifically partition histories, which is such an important history. Um, this interest really led me um, through collecting interviews to focus specifically on how partition refugees interacted with homes. And um, I did my own work doing oral histories in Delhi, but I think that doing my own oral history work really highlighted to me why the partition archive is such a valuable asset for the future. Because um, if you're a researcher like me and you're collecting oral histories, you're very focused on mining data associated with a very niche particular subject. So I wanted to talk to people about how they interacted with homes, how they obtained homes after migration. But the information I was collecting, while it was really helpful to my dissertation, it could never be used by any other researcher in the future um, because it is so particular. And um, while I didn't use the archives stories within my dissertation, they were extremely helpful to me because um, I ended up working with many of their volunteer oral historians who had a lot of experience working in Delhi. And the reason why this collection of people knew so much and were able to help me is because the archive is set up not just to collect accounts about the moment of migration, but really people's entire life worlds. So the question packets are oriented around asking people about what their everyday lives were like before migration and after migration. It's not just this one dramatic eventful moment. It's really a person's whole life experience from 70 years since they experienced this event. And so because of this, oral historians who had worked for the archive were able to direct me, a researcher who is interested, towards really being able to pinpoint specific areas that were relevant about thinking about particular types of housing in the city. So I think, I think that's an important um, distinction to remember when you think about what the archive is trying to achieve versus what a researcher might be trying to achieve through oral history and why it um, is producing something that's so much more valuable for the future than just one particular project. Um, beyond being a resource and public engagement, the archive is really a community. There's so many people who are connected on social media, but also um, through the archives listservs networks and it helps connect people with similar interests and to kind of illustrate this um, I became really close friends with Zahida Raymond Jop which who's actually a archaeologist who works in Pakistan through her involvement in partitions listservs and it was so unlikely that the two of us 
would have become friends. We've still never met in person actually, but um, we've co-authored papers together and we got married the same year. We've sent each other gifts in the mail and um, our interests are so similar. They both focus on how migrations of people at the time of the partition um, changed built landscapes and how that involves understandings about belonging and also heritage. And um, just to show how the archive can really um, stimulate research interest in a myriad of ways that maybe wasn't thought about initially, both Zahida and I together um, have published papers. Our most recent one was in the Journal of Social Archaeology, which is a pretty prominent theory focused journal in our field. And our work um, in this particular paper focused on Zahida's family's partition story. She actually migrated herself and she was raised in a building in Pakistan that had previously been a Sikh community building. And her family had tended a darga back in India since time immemorial, since before anyone could remember. But she um, wasn't sure if this darga still existed. And she wasn't able to travel to India because of the difficulty of traveling back and forth between countries. Um, but I was, and I was able to connect her with the Sikh community that now still maintains the darga. It's still very well cared for. And interestingly, um, the Sikh community building in which Zahida was raised, um, they've maintained it. And as you can see in the photo on the right, they've even preserved um, some Guru Mukhi script and kept it intact kind of out of respect for previous residents. And both the family that now tends for the Darga and Zahida were able to speak with each other over the phone as a result of our investigations into this history and how people interact with spaces. So I think this really goes to show that in addition to preserving these really important stories, the archive is really immediately creating this vast global interest in these histories and helping connect people with similar interests. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. I guess over over to uh, Sanjeev. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gunita, Aaron, uh, Jasbir. Uh, very informative, uh, but also incredibly moving, uh, uh, Jasbir, especially in your case. Uh, what a powerful story. Uh, I'd like to now invite everyone to participate, all our attendees who are online. Uh, what I would ask you is if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand in the app, in the Zoom app, not you know, physically on the screen. There's too many of you for me to see at a glance, but please raise your hand in the Zoom app and we'll direct your, uh, we'll uh, you know, uh, unmute you and have you direct your questions to uh, any of the speakers uh, that you may wish. I'll give it a few seconds for people to start raising their hands and asking questions. Uh, I see one for Consul General of India in New York, uh, Ranthir Jaiswal. Uh, Ranthir, uh, we invite you to come on the screen and ask your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Sanjeev. This was a beautiful session, you know, very engaging. And it's very important that we not only uh, understand partition, but also document it for reasons of what we have to do, how society has to progress, and what we have to learn from history, and how we are going to shape the narrative into the future. So all the three speakers made excellent presentation. Uh, my, you know, I, I come from Bihar, and uh, Bihar was equally impacted by the partition. It's for people who have uh, a side view of the partition somehow miss this point. You know, a lot of people from rural Bihar, from North Bihar, migrated to East Pakistan then, and uh, you know, while um, 
we are doing and we have this uh, project going on here and also in delhi i just wanted to leave this thought with our uh, with our people and with this uh, excellent team that some of the oral stories if you can pick up from there it will be interesting i for one could be of help i know of a family which i met in south africa they left their village in bihar went over to bangladesh in 1971 they had to leave bangladesh because they were hindi speaking stroke urdu speaking uh, muslims and they came to karachi in karachi they did not find a home and they had to leave karachi and then they came to swaziland and from swaziland they now based in south africa and every year they go back to their village in bihar in darbhanga district and when they go back to their village people ask them if you had to come back after 70 years why did you leave in the first place so you know there are several emotional stories as uh, like these which we need to tell and we count but uh, congratulations to in diaspora and also to 1947 archives for telling these beautiful stories um there are many aspects to uh, these things i would like to um ask um uh, the, the, any of any of the three speakers could could come on that uh, what are the difficulties you find as you document what are the key difficulties you know oral traditions uh, there are several challenges there could be uh, social challenges cultural challenges etc when you go to meet people of course in delhi uh, we have still have and in other parts of india we still have people who have been impacted so there is a lot of material lot of stories which can be put together the uh, you know a fascinating part of this history is that you know people who were impacted by partition are the ones who are still very emotional about their the the connection in fact i must tell you that once we were going through some a uh, very important uh, very learned gentleman Uh, while talking of partition he talked made a very subtle difference between vatan and desh he said vatan is the place where i was born and desh is the country where i live so in a sense you know he he if we try to put his understanding in our understanding of nationalism and nation states it will not figure there it's a totally new new concept so uh, these are some of my thoughts random thoughts i thought i'll sh- share with the the presentation presenters they made some very excellent points but i would like to hear from them the challenges that they face uh, in recording oral history well i could say from my perspective uh, since i am in usa i live in florida uh is for first of all it's hard to find people who have experienced this trauma because it is not so long and uh, many people are not living anymore uh some of them have a very hard time uh narrating those stories because of emotional reasons they do not want to go through the pain of uh, recounting those experiences and uh, the other thing is there are people who are available who are there but then we do not have volunteers to go to reach them out because they are far flung places we are all scattered so these are some of the challenges we have but now of course uh, you know thank you uh, rita ji we have technology and we are also able to interview them remotely uh, so that has facilitated but still uh, the fact remains that uh, there are far few people now surviving and who are ready to uh, tell their stories thank you jasveer watia ji your uh, really you know your talk was uh, very engaging i must say and very emotional thank for you. me as well thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so much uh, mr bhatia thank you so much uh, cg randeer uh, i believe we have a question next from raj mohan gandhi uh, uh in illinois a historian and uh, the grandson of uh, uh, mahatma gandhi we'll unmute you and uh, ask you to come on screen okay thank you fantastic you're on 
Thank you very much. Well, let me first of all say how deeply moved I have been by all the three who have spoken, uh, stirring uh, uh, recollections and, and uh, accounts. And I also want to salute the Partition Archive for the absolutely incredible work that has already been done. Uh, I may be allowed to mention that uh, my wife, who herself, uh, with her family, uh, they, they were uh, also, they moved from Sindh uh, towards India in 47. Uh, and so that was a factor, among other factors, in my wanting also to study the partition story. And uh, my wife, Usha, and I, uh, in 2005, we interviewed uh, a fair number of uh, people in different parts of India and in Lahore in Pakistan. And we also collected some uh, oral histories of uh, partition in, in these families. And these have been recorded in a book that I wrote, published in 2013 about this history of Punjab. And this has some of those stories and I will be sending these, if I may, to uh, Gunita Ji, and if those stories can also be made part of your archive, I would feel very privileged. Uh, you would be honored. <laughs> that these st stories we collected in 2005 uh, from some uh, uh, Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims in uh, uh, connected to Punjab. I only, uh, apart from appreciating and, and saying how inspired I am by the work that has been done and is ongoing, I would like to just share one thought, if I may, about the Radcliffe line that was mentioned. Uh, and, you know, Radcliffe line features in almost all accounts of partition. But one thing that I would like Pakistanis and Indians and Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs also to understand is, is the following. Radcliffe was the head of a commission to draw the line in Punjab and to draw a line in Bengal. But he was only one of five members. The other four members, two were either Hindus and Sikhs or two Muslims, two Muslims and two Hindus in Bengal, uh, two Muslims, one Sikh and one Hindu in Punjab. But because the Indians could not agree with themselves, so Radcliffe drew the line himself. If the Indians had agreed on a line, on a good line, Radcliffe would have had no choice but also to accept. So while it is natural, it is uh, common, it is uh, appropriate also to hold Radcliffe responsible, we should not forget that it was the failure of the Indian members of the commission, there were four of them, to agree that also contributed to the very, very uh, to, the, to the, you might say, absurdity in some cases of that line. So I just wanted to, this is one of the things that I learned during my, my research in the amazing story of Punjab and, and Bengal. So that's all. I have no question except to express my very deep uh, gratitude for what is being done. Thank you so much, uh, Rajmohan. Thank you for being on. Thank you for your comments. In fact, I have received several comments in the chat box privately uh, ex expressing how deeply moved they are and expressing their thanks to the 1947 partition archives for the work that they do. Uh, so your sentiments are widely echoed. I, I know we are a little bit over the stated time, but I think this topic has, like we were saying at the outset, it's so emotive and it uh, you know brings out so much in people wanting to engage that I think you won't mind if we go a little bit beyond. Uh, our next question is from Ram Gada, an Indian American community leader in the state of Minnesota. So Ram, we will wait to uh, unmute you and bring you on the screen. Thank you, Sanjeev. This is a very moving story, moving oral collection. I like to say here in Minnesota with Minnesota Historical Society, we have conducted oral history since 1994 for the early Indian immigrants came to Minnesota. In those interviews, there were several people who migrated from Pakistan. So, and there are many other people in Minnesota who have migrated either from uh, 
uh, East Bengal, East Pakistan or West Pakistan. So my question to the team is, are you interested to collect more stories so we can go each statewide? We can appeal to the people, for example, we can do in Minnesota, those who have migrated and their childhood experiences, and they are ready to do the oral history. And similarly, you can expand this project to rest of the states in the United States. Thank you. That would be incredible. Yeah, we would, uh, we would love to collaborate with you on that. Maybe I can reach out at, uh, via Sanjeev later. Happy yes, to, happy yes to please. We would be glad to uh, uh, conduct this as a process. We have India Association of Minnesota. We have Minnesota Historical Society where almost 100 oral histories have been preserved for years to come. Wow, that's incredible. Great, uh, thank you so much, Ram. Uh, I see the next hand raised up. Uh, I see Rajvi Berry. Uh, Rajvi, if you wanna go next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, Gunita, thank you so very much uh, for initiating this. Um, my actually late parents both, unfortunately, were, um, I guess, participa participant, uh, partition <laughs> survivors, if you will, left, unfortunately, Lahore, and then moved over to India, and then finally ended up emigrating here, but certainly had very, very, very painful experiences to share with us. However, at this point, I, I would say that if it's possible for you to maybe share on the chat about how we as I mean, I, I guess we're all first generation immigrants, at least in my case, in my parent, my brother's case and, and some of our relatives. Um, but if we could potentially help you contribute, if you could at least put it on your chat as to if there is an FEIN number, et cetera. So we actually can help your cause because that is probably the closest that we have come to as far as, I mean, after listening to our, the stories of our parents and what they really had to endure through this, that would be great. Cause we really, that's about the only thing I think we can do constructively going forward. And I certainly would be very, very interested in contributing and or helping in any way, shape or form. So thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning that Rajvi. Sorry, uh, go ahead Gunita. I know you had something to say and I think Rashina uh, who helped put this program together had something to say on this very point as well. So I'll bring both of you in uh, very quickly before moving on to the next question. I uh, know I was just going to say thank you. Um, in terms of putting it on the chat, I'll maybe rely on Mutsi a little bit. I think I don't have that access uh, at this moment. Okay. Can we, thank you for yeah, we'll certainly put, put uh, the requested material on the chat box, but uh, Rashina, you have helped arrange this program being, on, being involved in both organizations in diaspora and uh, the partition archives. And I know that you had uh, something to say quickly uh, on this on this matter. Rashina? Yeah, sure. I, I just want to say I've been involved with the work of the archive for the last two, three years, and I've been so impressed by the uh, by the hard work that uh, Gunita, the team, and, and so many volunteers put in. Uh, they have uh, collected stories from my husband's family that uh, migrated from Pakistan, as well as I found out after the fact, my own family that uh, stayed in India, uh, but had, you know, were impacted or influenced, you know, by the partition. So I, I just think the work that the archive does to, to preserve these stories, to share them, and then to bridge the gap that unfortunately the, the national borders have, you know, made so huge. Uh, between uh, citizens now of, of the three different countries and, and uh, across the world is, is just amazing. And I would, I would love to, you know, just, just give a shout out to the archive for the work they do. Um, and just, you know, also ask for, you know, support. Uh, it's, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, most of the, you know, volunteers work on a volunteer basis, but it, it's, it's a huge effort to, you know, train uh, the oral historians to 
to, to have the, the um, technology uh, and, and the data, data storing, the data archiving capability, uh, all those other things are just, you know, it's, it's amazing how much work goes into making sure that this work is diligently, you know, collected, preserved, and, you know, authenticated. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, the layers of work that is, uh, that we don't see. Mm. Uh, we just assume that some other stories populate. And then the fact that, you know, st scholars are out there, you know, like Gunita was in the Sundarbans and in various, you know, remote parts, not only of India, of Pakistan, of Bangladesh, and all over the world. Um, so uh, I just want to say um, this organization is amazing. Uh, I know I, I, uh, I have a vested in this in interest in that, you know, I have a family history from both mine and my husband's side that, that, is, uh, uh, that is relevant, but it's, it's so important to all of us. So do everyone go to uh, the 1947 Partition Archive uh, website uh, and uh, find out there's so many ways to participate by, you know, funds, of course, but, you know, bringing out witnesses as so many of you have brought up and letting us know that uh, we can connect with them and how to connect with them so we can, you know, archive their stories uh, by becoming story scholars, by, you know, spreading the word and, and everything. So I just wanna uh, thank you all for, for being here and listening and then thank you so much for the archive and diaspora for bringing this out. Thank you. Thank you, Rashana, for helping put this together and for everyone in, uh, in attendance, there is uh, in the chat room, I think Mansi, my colleague has posted the website for the 1947 partition archives. Uh, so if you would like to take a look at that, uh, that'd be great. We have several other questions and I think we could go on for another hour, literally, uh, just based on the interest, uh, not just the raised hand, but also in the chat that I'm receiving uh, privately and publicly. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. We'll just do one last question. Uh, and uh, Shikha Uberoy, I know that you've been uh, texting me for uh, several minutes and then you raised your hand as well. So Shikha, uh, if you want to ask your last question quickly, we have uh, three minutes uh, remaining and then we'll have to wrap up. I, I think Shikha may have dropped off. I don't see her. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mansi. That's fine then. Uh, if she emails me, Gunita, I'll make sure to convey her, uh, her question to you. Uh, so, you know, in that case, I think it's uh, time we wrap up, you know, being respectful of everybody's time. Uh, for anyone else who has questions and would like to ask them, feel free to email us at Indiaspora. Of course, you can email Gunita directly, but you can email us at Indiaspora and we can convey uh, your comments or questions over to, uh, to Gunita. Uh, my own email address is sanjeev at indiaspora.org. The spelling of my name is on the screen, S-A-N-J-E-E-V at indiaspora.org. But I'd like to end by saying thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, uh, Gunita, Jaspir, Aaron. Uh, it was just an incredible event. Uh, thank you so much. And to all of you participants for taking the time and spending a portion of your uh, evening slash morning, depending on where you are in the world with us here today. Thanks so much. And with that, we'll conclude this event. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. Thank you, Gunita. It was uh, interesting to hear people. And that means there's a lot more work to do. That's what I think. A lot more. A lot more work to do. And I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a great project. Thank right. you for your contributions and making it so.